for the blessings you've poured out, uh, for the grace you've given us through Christ. And, and Father, as we come together today to worship you, to praise you, uh, and Lord, to hear from your word this morning, I pray that our hearts are, are elevated, our hearts are lifted, and our eyes are turned towards you. And Father, I pray that the words that I would speak are, are your words, uh, Lord, not my own. Lord, that you would speak to your people today. And Father, we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, <clears throat> many of you know I, I, in the military, I'm a chaplain, and uh, one of the things I do as a chaplain is I, I do marriage retreats. And I, I always have fun doing them because uh, you, you get a curriculum that you do, and, and they're, they're a blast because the, uh, the military determined a long time ago that they probably need to take care of their families, and so they invest a lot into the families. And so I do these marriage retreats, and, and they, they put us up in different places. And, and this last weekend, it happened to be my anniversary, and we were running a marriage retreat at the Coeur d'Alene Resort. I'd not been to the resort in, in years. It had been years and years since I'd been there. And, and so as we're coming in, it's, it's interesting how many doors there are in a resort. And you come in off the, I don't know if you're familiar with the facility, but you come in out of the parking garage, and, and then you get out of the, the elevators, and, and you have options of which way to go. And so I turn to the left, and my wife is following me. And as I go to the door and I open the door, it's like a staff area where there's all types of machinery, and a guy's coming out, and I, oh, that's the wrong way. So we turn around, and we go the other direction, and we get to this open area, and I can turn to the right or to the left, and I'm waiting for my wife to tell me what to do, and, and she doesn't. And so we turn to the left, and, and we go into this conference center, and, and we're walking through. Now, you have to understand, I've got my bag, my computer, this, all this paraphernalia for the military that I'm carrying. She's carrying her bags, and we're walking through. We look like tourists walking through this conference center. She thinks we're going to where we're going to do the conference. I have no idea we're even doing the conference. And so we're walking through, and lo and behold, there's a funeral going on. And we're walking right through the middle of it. And now I can start to feel my body temperature rise. And I get a little worried, and I, oh, I just got to get to the door at the end of the hallway. Why would they put the door at the end of the hallway where you have to walk through all this stuff? When we get to the end of the hallway, I push open the door, and we're outside. And I realize this is the wrong direction. Now we got to turn around and go 50 yards back through the funeral, out to the lobby, and, as, and we're going, and there's a worker. I said, listen, we have no idea where we are. Where do we go to get to our room? And he says, you just go right down there straight through. And my wife says, yeah, I saw that when we came through. Why didn't you turn that way? And thanks a lot. So we walk back through, and, and we get there, and we get to the thing. So I'm, now I'm sweating, and I'm, I'm a little bit flustered because I'm, we walked through the middle of somebody's memorial service, which is kind of embarrassing. And so we get up to the room. I put my stuff. I was golly. And my wife starts crying. But it's not what you think. She is crying in laughter at me. And in the, it, I didn't even really register until she says, did you hear the song as we were walking through? And I go, yes, I heard the song. I couldn't help but hear the song. It was Elton John's Your Song. And the refrain that they kept singing is, I hope you don't mind. I hope you don't. And here we are walking through the middle of the funeral, hoping you don't mind. Here we come through. And, and oh, I got to go back. <laughs> Sorry. She was a lovely person. It's, it's kind of, it was, it's, man, so doors, you have options of doors. We come to a section of Scripture, in a spiritual sense, you also have options. But you have really one option to get to the destination you desire. And we come to a section of Scripture where Jesus is going to make two I am statements. I am the door, and I am the good shepherd. If you turn right now to, to John chapter 10, we're going to read through uh, this opening section there in John's gospel, or in, in John chapter 10. And we're going to see Christ articulate these two great, I, these I am statements that are very important for what it is we believe and understanding the exclusivity of what we believe, but also the openness of what Christ is offering. And so if you have your Bibles, let's jump in there to John chapter 10. We'll pick up in verse 1 and just read a few verses down uh, through here. So begins this way, truly, truly, I say to you, he who does not enter the sheepfold by the door, but climbs in by another way, that man is a thief and a robber. But he who enters by the door is the shepherd of the sheep. To him, the gatekeeper opens. The sheep hear his voice, and he calls his own sheep by name and leads them out. When he has brought out all his own, he goes before them, and the sheep follow him, for they know his voice. 
A stranger they will not follow, but they will flee from him, for they do not know the voice of strangers. This figure of speech Jesus used with them, but they did not understand what he was saying to them. So Jesus again said to them, Truly, truly, I say to you, I am the door of the sheep. All who came before me are thieves and robbers, but the sheep did not listen to them. I am the door. If anyone enters by me, he will be saved and will go in and out and find pasture. The thief comes only to steal and kill and destroy. I came that they may have life and have it abundantly. I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd lays down his life for the sheep. He who is a hired hand and not the shepherd who does not own the sheep sees the wolf coming and, the leave, and leaves the sheep and flees. And the wolf snatches them and scatters them. He flees because he is a hired hand and cares nothing for the sheep. I am the good shepherd. I know my own and my own know me. Just as the Father knows me, and I know the Father, I lay down my life for the sheep. And I have other sheep that are not of this fold. I must bring them also. And they all will listen to my voice. So there will be one flock, one shepherd. For this reason the Father loves me, because I lay down my life that I may take it up again. No one takes it from me, but I lay it down of my own accord. I have authority to lay it down, and I have authority to take it up again. This charge I have received from my Father. And we'll, we'll stop there and see if we can kind of parse out a little bit of what's going on there. What, what Christ opens up, the, the, the actual parable that he presents there in the beginning, there is some confusion because there's a lot of pieces to that. But then he has to come back and explain he's all the pieces. And, and that's kind of what happens is we lose track of it when, when he's addressing something of a spiritual nature and he's using worldly terms. It, it's, it loses, we lose track of what's going on. But he comes back and he describes, I am the door. And, and that's an important thing because we look at that and have to recognize it is only through Christ can we be saved? Does eternal life come from? And he talks about there's this contrast because he addresses these thieves and robbers that came to steal and destroy. And really what Christ is doing there is condemning the religious leaders. Now, now we know from, from the context of that that he's addressing the Jews specifically. And, and we also know but in the dynamic of that, that that the Pharisees have come out against him. If you've been with us, we've kind of walked through this quite a bit. But we look at this and, and can see this also uh, through the prophets Jeremiah and Ezekiel. In Jeremiah 23, it says, Woe to the shepherds who destroy and scatter the sheep of my pasture, declares the Lord. In Ezekiel 34, we see, You eat the fat and you clothe yourselves with the wool. You slaughter the fat ones, but you do not feed the sheep. So this condemnation was, was really addressed at those who were there, who were in the positions and in the roles to take care of the flock. But what are they doing? They're not. They're, they're not taking care of the flock. They're caring for themselves instead of caring for the flock. This sets up as to why they want to destroy Christ. If we think back to last week when we talked about the mud ball that Jesus threw at a guy, hit him in the eyes, told him to go wash off and he could see, it, we look at that and, and we, we realize the fascinating aspect and element of this guy was born blind, all of a sudden miraculously, boom, all of the neural pathways are set up for his visual system, now he can see, and the Pharisees are, hey, who did this to you? Do they know it's the Sabbath? Because they shouldn't be doing that. Right? I mean, that's, that's the reality. That's, that's the contrast here. They don't care about this miracle that's been worked out, and Christ is now addressing them and their lack of care, their lack of compassion for the flock. Because he is, the, he is not only the door, but he is the good shepherd. We'll address that in a moment. But what's interesting here is, is we can look at this and see this still today rings true. When, when Christ is addressing that, it doesn't mean that it's exclusively to that group. We look at this and, and realize we have religious leaders or spiritual leaders now. And the, the sign of a spiritual leader that is really designed or intended to draw you to Christ, that would, that would be one that we, we've referred to me. Let me kind of go through how we do this. We would refer to me as an under-shepherd. I am not the good shepherd because a wolf comes, y'all are on your own. That's just it. Searle cares about you, and he told me, I'll fight, Steve. I said, go for it. I'm going to Canada. That's, no, no, that's not the truth. Um, only partial. Some of you all stay for it. Um, but, but no, but we, look at it, we realize that, that, that really what's the role of, of a leader in this element is no, to point to him. Don't, don't, it, look, you can follow after me, but make sure I'm following him, because if I'm not following him, I have no idea where I'm going. But we see a lot of times now Dynamics where it's not built around follow Christ. It's this hyper-spirituality of follow yourself. And you can be your own guide and find your own path. 
Because really, if it's true for you, that that's okay. Right? No, that's, that's false. If it's true to you, it could be a lie, and now you're believing a lie. We established that a few weeks ago when Jesus said that his disciples abide in him, and they know the truth, and the truth sets them free. But when we look at this, we, we see for ourselves a, a degree or an element of spirituality run amok. Everyone has spiritual beliefs, even, even those who would profess to have none. Everybody has spiritual beliefs. I can speak to this because in one of the, the taskings I have as a chaplain is to uphold and build resiliency within the spiritual realm for uh, military members. That's part of the gig. And, and the understanding is everybody has a spiritual belief system. And the way we, we would look at that is that is where you find your purpose in life. And that's the important piece. Everybody has a belief system that they believe in that, where they find their purpose. It could be a pretty weak system. We're not, we're not saying every system is equal. That's not, but, but everybody has a system that they believe in where they find their purpose. And, and one of the things that happens is we tend not to question those systems. Let's question them a little bit because Jesus certainly questions them. If he is the door, he is, this is ex- exclusivity. That means there is no other way. He's the only way. He's the only one you can go through to find good pasture, to find abundant life, to find eternal life. But we live in a culture and a time frame now where this kind of spirituality run amok is what I say, but, but there, there's the, almost the salad bar approach or salad bar beliefs. I'll take a little bit of that, that a little bit of this, a little bit of that. Ooh, I'll pass on the Jesus stuff watching my figure. But we, we, we look at it, I'll take some of these things that I agree with, because that already fits with what I want to believe about me, because I'm a wonderful person. But I'll pass on the rest. That's not going to get you where you go. That's, that's opening the door, and oh my gosh, there's the workers, they're coming out at me. That's the wrong direction. We've got to find the right door. A second thing is we see with this, and I'll expand on this a little bit more later, is unbiblical churches and those that would base their beliefs not on the teachings of Christ and God's Word, but on cultural shifts or human ideas that are palatable to a sinner. I want to be careful how I say this. We need to, when we express the gospel to those lost, it needs to be done. We need to become all things to all men so that some might be saved. The message of the gospel never changes, though. The methodology with which I will express it might change. I could use PowerPoint. I could use these things. I could do all these things. We can throw a drum set on stage. I mean, there's all different things that I'll do in order to take the gospel out, but the gospel message always stays the same. What we see start happening is... I don't like that message. That's a, that's a fairly closed-minded message. I have to go through Jesus and Jesus alone. Well, what about me? I'm a great person. Maybe I can do it on my own. No. But the problem is we now have churches that are established in adjusting and adapting and embracing cultural shifts. And I'll talk a little more about that, like I said, in a moment. But when we look at this, what that leads to is a belief that we are the door. But his sheep, it's interesting because what Christ says is, my sheep know my voice. They know, they'll follow after me. Not everybody follows after him. Now, we have to understand that people have, there are different sheep. There are people that are not going to be saved. That's a hard thing for many of us Christians to recognize and acknowledge. There are people that will not be saved. They will choose not to follow Christ. They will choose in this life that they don't want Jesus in their life. Why then would God force them for all of eternity to be face-to-face with Him? He's created a place completely separate for them where there's weeping and gnashing of teeth. But we, we look at this and recognize, though, that, that there are his, his sheep recognize the falsehood and follow after Him. We recognize His voice and realize nothing else will satisfy it's like walking through the Coeur d'Alene Resort and, and realizing this is not the room I want to be in. As your wife laughs at you, this stupid fool, if he'd have just turned right instead of left. It's kind of the story of our marriage, by the way. My wife is loving and caring, and I say, God's called us to do this. And she goes, okay. 
And then I charge through doors, and she kind of stands back and watches and laughs. <laughs> he said this way, dummy. <laughs> Thanks! And off we go, right? I mean, that's that's kind of how it's been for 21 years. It's like, yes, let's go get them there! And I would run, and bam, into a brick wall. What happened? You ran the wrong way. Okay! That's how you end up in places like Keller Ferry, Washington on a ranch. I know nothing about ranching, but here I am on a 600-acre ranch. <laughs> I know nothing. Horses are dying. Oh, by the way, that's where I found out how dumb sheep are. This is a new group of people, so I'm going to tell you this story. Some of y'all old folks that have been here for a while have heard this story. Jesus talks about us and he calls us sheep, right, a, a lot of times. And, and we kind of jokingly say, ah, sheep are stupid. Let me tell you how dumb they are. We were on this ranch in Keller Ferry, and there were sheep there, and there was big sheep. And I'm driving a van with the director of the, the program that we're doing, and driving, he's been there for a while, he knows these sheep. There's a sheep in the middle of the road, and I'm driving. And he says, don't worry about it, it'll move. Are you sure? Yeah, don't worry, it's going to move. And, and we're getting closer to this sheep. You sure it's going to move? Yeah, yeah, don't worry about it. <laughs> It didn't move at all. And then it wasn't moving after that either. And I looked at it and I said, it didn't move. And he goes, that's ah, never done that before. <laughs> and I realized, I'm sitting here thinking, how stupid is this sheep? And then I realized, how stupid am I? <laughs> Driving a van right over there. There's the sheep in the middle of the road. Oh, I'm not going to stop. Blah, 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 blah. The sheep lived. I don't know how much longer, but it lived for a little while after that. But we look at it, so, so the sheep didn't get out of the way. But when Christ calls us that, the recognition is sheep are going to go where their leader tells them to go. And so when we look at this, we're listening for his voice. Where is he calling us to go? What is he telling us? That's what we seek for because that is where we know comfort's going to be. That's where we know peace is going to be. That's where we know pasture's going to be, where it's gonna be, we're going to be fed, where there's, there's all of this. That is what we are seeking after, and that's what we find in Christ. And we know that he is the only one that can deliver that. And so when he identifies this or, or states this about regarding his sheep, we can think of, of what Christ states in here, or what, what uh, Peter and John state in Acts 4. In speaking of Christ, he is the stone that was rejected by you, the builders. They're addressing the Sanhedrin. And he's become the chief cornerstone, and there is salvation in no one else. For well, there is no other name under heaven given among men by which we must be saved. Now Christ addresses who his sheep are. And now we have to remember contextually he's addressing the Jews that are there. But then he says something interesting that we, we need to pay attention to. He says, but I have sheep that are, that are not of this fold. I have to go get them. And that's important for us to look at and say, okay, well, who is that? Now to understand the context of who he's speaking with, they're going to understand that as Gentiles. If you're not a part of the, Jew, of, of the Jewish culture, if you're not a part of the Abrahamic lineage, you're a Gentile, you're outside. And so that's where we see uh, what, what Christ, the, we see the beginnings of his intention is not just for you, this is for all of them. If we remember the Abrahamic covenant or the promise that it was going to be through Abraham that all the nations would be blessed. And, and we look at that and realize what Christ is doing is stating to them, not only is my kingdom going to be made up of you? It's going to be made up of them. Now, why is that important to us? We're the them. That's, that's important for us as we recognize that and realize he's thinking of us in the midst of this. And so when we look at that, we see what uh, part of what his plan is out in this. Later on in the book of Acts, we learn of a gentleman named Saul. And Saul stands by as they persecute and kill Stephen. And they toss their coats down at his feet, and Saul gets authorization to go and, and gather and bind and begin to heavily persecute the church. But it's on the, on the road that there's a bright light, and it knocks him off of his horse. And from the light, Christ says, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? Who are you, Lord? It's me, Jesus, that you're persecuting. And he's stricken blind. And then later we see Christ goes and he speaks and he addresses uh, Ananias. And tells Ananias to go and he's going to speak to Paul, to Saul at that time. Ananias answered, Lord, I have heard from many about this man, 
how much evil he has done to your saints at Jerusalem. And here he has authority from the chief priests to bind all who carry on your name. But the Lord said to him, Go, for he is my chosen instrument of mine to carry my name before the Gentiles, before the kings and the the children of Israel. For I will show him how much he must suffer for the sake of my name. And if you know the story of Paul, his life is a life of a lot of suffering, but taking the gospel to the Gentiles. He wrote most of the New Testament, and he wrote most of it from prison. And so we look at this and realize that in this statement that Christ makes, at this point in his ministry, he's already thinking, and he has been thinking all the time, not just of the the lost sheep of the nation of Israel, but he's looking at this worldwide recognition. He knows the beginning from the end. And so he's recognizing that in 2020, somebody's going to be up here proclaiming this, and he knows you're going to be sitting here listening to this and recognizing that he's speaking about you as one of his. You see, that's, that's the power that we see here. And not only was it evident there, but we can go back a few chapters into Ezekiel chapter 34. And it reads this, For thus says the Lord God, Behold, I myself will search for my sheep and will seek them out. As a shepherd seeks out his flock when he is among the sheep that have been scattered, so will I seek out my sheep. And I will rescue them from all places where they have been scattered on a day of clouds and thick darkness. And I will bring them out from the peoples and gather them from the countries, and I will bring them into their own land. And I will feed them on the mountains of Israel by the ravines and in all the inhabited places of the country. I will feed them with good pasture, and on the mountain heights of Israel shall be their grazing land. And they shall lie down in good grazing land, and on rich pasture shall feed on the mountains of Israel. I myself will be the shepherd of my sheep, and I myself will will make them lie down, declares the Lord God. And, and so that, that's a longer section, but the importance of what's happening there, it, and if you're not recognizing what just transpired, God said, I will be your shepherd. And here is Jesus standing and saying, I am the good shepherd. You see, the, the recognition of this, this is important for us to recognize what's being communicated in the midst of this. The Jews know exactly what he's saying. He's saying, I'm God. I'm God. I'm the only way that you can be saved. I'm the only way to salvation. I am the door and I am the good shepherd. The shepherd that has been promised that God said he himself would be. I'm here. See, that's powerful what Christ is in the midst of this to these folks that, that they're not, some of them are getting it, some of them aren't getting it. And the section at the tail end of this, it creates division again amongst the Jews. But for us, we look at this, man, that's a powerful statement. Because how he's going to end this is a little bit different than what we might expect. But that moves us into this uh, recognition or understanding of that if we follow after him, that one of the things he's promised is abundant life. Now, we might ask in the midst of this, what really is abundant life? Is it the notion that once I commit my life to Christ, everything will be all right, and I get whatever it is I want, and it's going to be gumdrops, and lollipops, and rainbows all day long. And I mean, that's really what it is. If your life is not like that, you're doing something terribly wrong. It's wonderful. No, but we, we look at that and realize that's not the real identity of an abundant life. Now, for our own purposes... Boy, wouldn't that be nice sometimes if things were just a little easier? If I, you know, the, the, the depression, the sadness, the anxiousness, all of these, if those would just kind of go away for a while, I'd offer to you what Christ offered and what he said regarding life in this world. In Matthew 5, blessed are you when others revile and persecute you and utter all kinds of evil against you falsely on my account. Rejoice and be glad, for your reward is great in heaven, for so they persecuted the prophets who were before you. And later in John's gospel, we'll read, Remember the word that I said to you, a servant is not greater than his master. If they persecuted me, they will also persecute you. If they kept my word, they will also keep yours. But all these things they will do to you on account of my name, because they do not know him who sent me. What then is abundant life? And it really, for us, we, we, this creates a dynamic and a dilemma. What, what is abundant life? 
If it's not the guarantee of riches, the guarantee of a boat that goes faster, a bigger truck, all of these things, if that's not the guarantee of an abundance, then what is it? We have to go in and out and find pasture in Him. See, the promise in this world is that we will be comforted. The promise in this world is that the Good Shepherd won't leave us alone. But there's a promise that exceeds beyond this world. You see, it's the promise of eternal life. Now, we tend not to think all that much about what this actually means. But part of what we get in in the recognition of eternal life is this understanding that in the midst of a discontent world, we can find contentment in understanding the reality that I will live forever. And how do I know this? Because my Savior died for me laid down his life for me to pay a debt that I owe. And on the third day was raised. And he lives. And he is seated at the right hand of God, making petition on my behalf. He's mine. You see, the the, the reality, the resurrection of Christ, the power of what he states here is, I have the authority to lay down my life, and I have the authority to take it back up again. The power of what we believe, the the recognition of the abundant life comes wrapped in that statement that I will live for eternity not by my own strength, not by my own power, not by my own efforts, but through the sacrificial and merciful grace of Christ who gave himself for me and overcame death in order that I can live. You to think of Jesus just stated again, and if you've been with us, you know this. This is he's echoed this. You know, it's easier for me just to say all throughout this, he's saying, "I am God. I am God. I am God. I'm the one. I'm here to save you. I'm God." But people don't get it, right? We and we still struggle with it. But all through that, so I want you to think of this. He's, He's stating this: "I am God. I'm God. I'm God." All throughout this, he's telling it to the Jews. Some of them believe, some of them don't. The disciples are following him. Eleven of them are on it. Uh, the other ones, like, ah, I don't know. But we look at it. so all the way through this, and then he says, "This, I'm going to lay down my life for you. God is going to die for you to pay a price that you owe. What kind of love is that?" You see, and that's when he talks about the the good shepherd will lay his life down for the sheep. That's what he's addressing is the hired hands, they're going to run away. There's nobody else that's willing to do this. Think of that. There is no other king that's going to, who's going to die for their subjects? I might die for my family. I might die for some friends, but my enemies, come on. And here he is, God, saying, I'm going to die for you, but don't worry, because i got the authority to take my life back up. And by overcoming death, I'm going to give you eternal life. So when we talk about abundant life, what is it? One, it's the, the ability to recognize, I'm just passing through, man. Let Portland burn, I'm okay. No, it's a terrible thing to say. But I've been to Portland, so maybe it's not that bad. Um, so I grew up down there, so it's okay. I can say that because I grew up down there and got a lot of bad memories in Portland. I'm just hoping those places burn down. Um, but we, we look at that and we, we realize, though, I'm, I'm just passing through. I'm in this relationship with a holy God who loved me enough to die for me and to overcome death for me, that I can live and receive eternal life. There is nothing in this world, though I can be discontented, though I can be upset, though I will experience life in a fallen world, I can keep my eyes affixed upon Christ. That's abundant life. See, that's what the promise is in this world. And then likewise, we receive this eternal life through Christ, the only door that works. There's a lot of doors. Some will put you to a funeral. Some might end up in your own funeral. You got the wrong door, splat, there you go. Some will put you outside looking at a rider truck wondering, where's the elevator? There's only one that's going to work, and that's Jesus. He states that he's the good shepherd. And I want to just address four quick things. Yeah. 
<laughs> Four things. They may not be quick. I think Jason messed with my clock. <laughs> that are stated here. First off, the, the, the good shepherd is willing to sacrifice. These are four aspects of the good shepherd. Lays down his life for his sheep. It's interesting as the contrast here is that the, Christ states the thief kills, the good shepherd lays down his life for his sheep, dies for them. And that's the interesting part when we, we look at this and recognize who it is we have in Christ because that sets up the next piece. This other aspect of a good shepherd is this personal relationship. The personal relationship you can have with a holy God through his grace, through his mercy. I don't know if you've ever thought about this in your own life. I, I've thought repeatedly, and, and sometimes when I counsel others and I realize how messed up I am and I look at how messed up they are and I think, man, we're just a bunch of messed up people. And, and then I, I think, but, but we, it, you know, a lot of times when I counsel or anything, I'll close in prayer. I think we, can ha we have the ability to go directly to God through Christ. Sinners who have been forgiven, the unrighteous who have been made righteous through him, can go into the holy throne room and put our petition and speak directly to God. Now it's interesting because I get a lot of people that ask for prayers, and I'll pray for you. you get, there is a quota though. And the elders will send out a bill. If you've reached your quota, we'll send you a prayer bill. Um, that's how we're funding the building project. No, there's not. There's not. Somebody will, somebody will believe that. They'll be so upset. I can't believe it. No, we don't have a, a prayer bill, but that's a good thing. Write it down, Cyril. <laughs> but but we, we, I'll pray for you. I get no problem with that. In fact, I enjoy it. Yeah, yeah pray for them because their life's messed up. Yeah, I'd love to pray for those things. But I always think, it's the turn, make sure you're praying for yourself too. Make sure you're praying because you, could, you don't have to go through me. That's what Christ was all about. That's what, that's what all this, so that you can go before a holy God in this personal relationship. This, this God that loved you and desired you so much that as he's talking to this, this Jewish crowd, he's thinking about you. And as he looks at this, and I, I, I do, I think, it's, man, it, it, from the foundation of the world, he knows his sheep, and his sheep know him. And, and I look at this and think, man, from the foundation he knew. And so we, we recognize, man, this is a personal God. This good shepherd is willing to engage us personally. And as his sheep, we know his voice. And what's, what's amazing with that, is that we see him, we recognize him, we know him, we love him. But I even find it more, for me, amazing that he knows me and that he knows us. If, if you ever know ranchers and they have lots of cattle or sheep or whatever, they'll put brands on them. That's in part so they can identify them. Right, so they can tell, oh, this is my cow, that's your cow, this is that. So they put brand. You don't have a brand. That would be kind of cool, though. Right? We'll get a Crossroads brand. Psst. You guys walk in the door. This is your second time? All right, you're in. But I go to this one, or I'm just visiting. No, you're not. Searle's got the cattle prod in case you try to run. This is zaps you, drops you. Psst. Ah. Jeff's chasing you with the branding iron. Write that one down, too, Cyril. We're on it. We're going to grow this thing one way or another. No, that's, but, but we, Jesus doesn't need that, right? He knows you. He, he knows you're, that you're mine. And what's interesting with this is what happens when you run away? He chases you. You know, they have this shepherd's crook. You know why? Because some of them sheep would run away. You know what they would do with that? They'd break the legs of the sheep and he'd carry it around. You may not have known that. That's what they would do. Something to man, you can do this. Why? Because uh, you're mine. 
I'm not letting you away. If you're a Christian and you've ever walked, tried to walk away, he sends the hounds after you and they chase you down. And it's painful. Don't ask me how I know. A pastor, I would never try that. But that's, that's the reality. That's what happens. You're his. That's this personal relationship. As we push forward, there's the third aspect here is this unifying. We're one in him. There'll be one flock and one shepherd. In Ezekiel, we read, I will set up over them one shepherd, my servant David, and he shall feed them and he shall feed them and be their shepherd. Further on in Ezekiel 37, we see my servant David shall be king over them and they shall have one shepherd and they shall walk in my rules and be careful to obey all of my statutes. Now you may wonder why, why is he called David? What's that about? That's the lineage aspects. It talks about the promise that God made to David that one of his in his line would sit on the, the throne for eternity. And that's why in the beginning of some of the Gospels, you have this lineage of Christ that links him back to the Davidic line. Because he's in that line. He's the promised one to sit on the throne forever. And so his, what God is saying is he is going to be there. There's going to be one flock unified. Now that's where I'm going to, I'm going to just parse this out very briefly a little bit. But it's interesting in, in the world that we, we live in where there is so much division right now. I don't know if you guys can feel it, but it, it really is. There's a lot of division. And it's a, a lot of it's surrounding politics, but I do think there's a bigger spiritual issue at hand. I think there's a, 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 a lot of that going on is, is really spiritually bound. But what's interesting to me is what everybody on, on either side is crying for is unity. And, and when you break it down, I want, we want peace, we want this, we want... But it, it comes back to we want this unity. We want, and I look at it and think, man, it's all offered through Christ. It's not offered anywhere else. It's all offered in Jesus. Everything that you're saying you want is present in Christ. Well, I don't want that. <laughs> then you don't really want what you're saying you want. But that's, that's what we have to get back to is this recognition of that, that there's this unity... In Colossians, Paul says, here, is, here there is no Greek or Jew, circumcised and uncircumcised, barbarian, Scythian, slave, free, but Christ is all and in all. Elsewhere in Galatians, Paul writes, for in Christ Jesus, you are all sons of God through faith. For as many of you were baptized into Christ have put on Christ. There is neither Jew nor Greek, there is neither slave nor free, there is neither male nor female, for you are all one in Christ Jesus. And if you are Christ's, then you are Abraham's offspring and heirs according to the promise. And so when we see that, we recognize what's, what's, what's Paul stating there? What's Christ stating? What's God been saying this whole time is my one flock is unified. That's why the, the importance of what's happening within the church or the importance of what's happening really for Christians is that it comes back to Jesus. Now, there was a movement a while ago and you, you may not be familiar, and, and realistically, you might not be familiar with any of the terms that I'm going to use. Um, and that's okay, because you'll know some of the byproducts of the terms that I'm going to use. Back when we started Crossroads, there was a thing called the Emergent Church. And, and it was, there, was, there was the Emergent Church, and there was an Emerging Church. And, and I, I remember when we planted Crossroads, I thought, I don't know what either one of these things are. But it was a very, pro the emergent one was a very progressive mindset, mindset. Not a progressive in a good way, like let's expand the gospel or the kingdom. It was progressive in a, in a different way. Like let's, let's not be bound by the word of God. And it kind of went away. A lot, of people, a lot of people stood up and said, whoa, 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 this isn't okay. And so it kind of went away. But it didn't really. It went underground. Now there's a thing called the progressive church, and it's popular, very popular, and they're into a lot of deconstructionism and deconstructing your faith and tearing down truth because there really is no truth. And if you think you've got truth, well, yeah, I'm sorry. You just haven't been freed of that yet. Now we look at that, and, and for us, and we're in Airway Heights, Washington, right? What's interesting is that is very, 
very popular in the Christian world right now. When you see these big names falling and say, I'm no longer a Christian, that's part of the result of that. I've deconstructed my faith to realize I don't believe this. And I look at it and think, that's foolishness. Because I look at this and realize in, in Christ there is unity. In Christ, it, the, the reality of it is, is this recognition that he's the one. Now later on in 1 John we see, well, they went out from us because they were never a part of us. And I'm like, okay, well, that makes sense. But I say that because for us it's important to keep our eyes on Christ. Because whether you know those terms I used, emergent, progressive, any of that stuff, you're going to hear intersectionism and all. I mean, that's, all of these things are making their ways into churches. They're making their way into our denomination as well. And in fact, the elders are very keenly aware of what's going on and are in the middle of standing up and saying no. But it's very sneaky and tricky. It's kind of like when you put jelly on something, you it kind of splats. It's hard to get a hold of, right? But it's there. And so part of it for you as a saint, as a, as a follower of Christ, is recognize what voice do you listen to? If I'm up here spewing something that's not of Christ, then ignore me. I'm not that important a guy. That's not an amen. What is that about? I got heads nodding, yeah. And Cyril standing up in the back. That's the best thing I've heard all day. Come on. You hear the voice of Christ. That's what you listen for. Because in that, there's unity. The final aspect of the good shepherd is this authority. He has the authority to lay down his life and to take it up again. And so when we, we recognize this, we see what he, what he states here in 17 and 18, because I lay down my life that I may take it up again. No one takes it from me, but I lay it down of my own accord. I have the authority to lay it down, and I have the authority to take it up. This charge I have received from my father. One of the hallmarks of, of many um, portions of that progressive church mindset, and this is what you may hear popping up in the few months, is this cosmic child abuse argument around for a while that this is cosmic child abuse. But here we see Jesus say, no, I'm going to do this of my own will. I have the authority. If Jesus is who he said he is, then Jesus is God. And therefore, he's the one that has the authority to lay down his life. He's the one that has the authority to take it back up again. You see, when you start deviating away from the scripture, you start deviating away from the truth, you're left with your own thoughts, your own perceptions. And I can offer to you as a guy who was brought up in liberal thought mindsets, liberal when it was called liberal, now it would be progressive mindset, in a very progressive field of mental health counseling and, and clinical psychology. And I played in all of that stuff and realized, man, this is a mess. Little bits here that I can listen to, bits here, but yeah, then there's a giant mess in the midst of this. When people are left to their own designs and their own mindsets and perceptions without any grounding in truth, they will come up with crazy things. Just think of some of the crazy things you've come up with. Wives, think of those crazy things your husband's come up with to do. You're like, well, no, we don't need a door there. Why did you put a hole in the wall? It's a great idea. No, it's not. Anyway, that's, that's what we get back to. So I guess I say all that to get back to the authority of Christ. And so when we look at this, we are inundated with this. All of these other voices calling out, statements calling out. You walk off the elevator and you look around and there's doors everywhere. What door do I take? It's probably the one with big flashing lights. It says Jesus, right? I mean, that would be, wouldn't that be nice? But let me, let me help you if, if you didn't recognize that. Let me put it, that's the big flashing door. The door you take is Jesus. Walk through it. In the midst of walking and engaging in a fallen world, we find our hope and compassion, in the compassion and comfort of the Good Shepherd. So as you leave this place, You'll walk out this door into the rest of the world. 
He's not left you alone. He's with you there. He's with you here. He loves you and cares for you. He will not leave you. He won't forsake you. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you for the exclusivity of Christ. Lord, that you didn't leave it up to us to do. You didn't leave it up to us because, we, Lord, we can't do it. Our sin nature keeps us from being able to do it. But, Lord, we thank you for the grace that you've poured out, the mercy you've poured out by Christ taking upon himself flesh to walk amongst us, to be like us, and to die for us. But Lord, you didn't stop there to overcome death that we can receive eternal life. That we can receive a, an heir, be heirs of, of that which we didn't work for. We thank you, Lord, for your grace, for your mercy, for your love, for the truth that you've revealed of yourself. We thank you, Lord. Father, we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.